So especially the rocky surface planets of Venus and Mars, there is a lot that we can understand about our uh, shaping of the planet Earth. For example, the atmosphere of Venus. Anyone know what the atmosphere of Venus? Carbon dioxide, the stuff that we exhale, right? So as we are just standing at any given moment of the day, when we are exhaling, we are putting carbon dioxide out into the air. And Venus and Mars are both almost completely carbon dioxide. So not the most friendly of places for humans, and I'm not trying to convince anyone of not going to Mars. There certainly are plans to do so, and we are definitely capable of sending things to Mars. But thus far we've only said rovers, landers, flyby satellites. And the thing about robots is you don't need to feed them, they don't need to breathe or drink water, they don't ask for pay raises, they don't need to sleep. Right, all these different things, whereas astronauts, human beings, require a lot of different things in order to survive in the harsh conditions of traveling through space and being on other worlds. But we'll make it there, we'll make it there. Humans are ingenuitive, and when you look at these capsules on either side here, there are uh, quite a few flags there, representing countries from all around the world, because space exploration is not the mission of any one particular country or agency or company. It is a mission for all of humanity. All of humanity. So for my astronaut friends that would like to go to another world, or maybe are just curious about geology here on Earth, this is something that will give us a lot of information about history. So when you look at these rocks here, right, they have these very distinct layers. It's almost like looking at a book, edge on, and seeing all the different pages. And each of these layers of rock is a page in a history book of the formation of this world. Right? Has anyone ever seen a world or a landscape like this before? Right? I see some heads nodding. Well, that's because a lot of the marks that we, a lot of the rocks we've thus discovered on Mars are the same type of rocks that we have here on Earth including uh, sandstone, like we have here, sandstone, as well as some different types of volcanic rocks. So this is basalt, more specifically vesicular basalt, because it has all of these little bubbles in it. Maybe there was trapped gas there, because as lava cools, it cools with bubbles inside, just like when you bake something. There are little pockets of air inside, and lava is similar in that way. And actually, a lot of the ocean floors here on Earth are made up of basalt. There's all kinds of volcanic activity on Earth, but a lot of it is under the ocean. A lot of it's under the ocean. And on Mars, raise your hand if you knew this, there are volcanoes on Mars. Raise your hand if you just learned that. Awesome, awesome. You can share that at your next cocktail party. Uh, oh, did you know Mars has volcanoes? Uh, and everyone will be so impressed. And you can even add on, not only does Mars have volcanoes, it has the largest volcanoes in the solar system. There is one uh, volcano in particular called Olympus Mons that could cover the entire state of Arizona or Colorado or the country of France. It's massive. It is so tall that there have been dust storms that have covered the entire planet of Mars, but the very top of Olympus Mons sticks out past the atmosphere. So actually, if you were standing at the summit of Olympus Mons, you'd have your feet on the planet, but the rest of you would be sticking up into space. That's huge. Imagine if the, the climbers of Mount Everest were so high up that their heads were poking out into space past you know, uh, the different uh, layers of the atmosphere, being able to look out into a starry sky. Really amazing stuff to think about. And Mars is one particularly interesting world. So when it comes to the formation of a planet, we're gonna take a deeper look at these layers with this thing right here. And no, this is not a staff for fighting off any potential Martians. You know, 
I would not be qualified for that. This is a straw. It's a metal straw. It's a really fancy straw to put down into the rock and then pull out a core. Right? When you eat an apple, you're left with a core, a column. That's all that is. We're just going to pull out a column of rock. And we use this kind of equipment here on Earth on the regular. On, the, on a regular basis. Uh, for different applications, there are some practical things. Like for demolition of buildings, they'll take out a core from the pillars and they'll plant you know, charges to detonate so they have a controlled collapse of the building. We're not doing anything pyrotechnic today. That'd be very exciting, but also pretty dangerous. And again, I'm not qualified for that. So instead, we're going to be using it for research. And we use core drills here on Earth, uh, at the South Pole, for example. And in Lakewood, Colorado, there's a storage facility for ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica. So you're only standing a few miles away from frozen ice that is tens of thousands of years old. And inside those ice cores are little pockets of air, little bubbles of air, like in this cool down lava rock, all those little bubbles. So as layers and layers of snow build up across millennia, they're trapping little bubbles of the atmosphere from that time. And we can look at the bubbles of air to get an idea of what the atmosphere is like. So how cool would it be to drill down into Mars and to maybe find you know, some more of those basalt rocks with those little pockets in it that maybe have trapped gas from long ago, and we could look at the atmosphere of Mars. Maybe it wasn't always carbon dioxide. Probably wasn't, because there's very strong evidence that there was once water on Mars. And as far as we know, water is one of the key ingredients to have life. So here's another question for you. Who thinks at one point in the past there was something alive on Mars? There once or aliens, see some hands. Raise your hand if you think, mm, even now, there is something alive on Mars. That would be very cool. And this piece of equipment could be one of the ways to find out. And I'm not even talking about sending people to Mars in the future that we could learn this. Even today, there is a rover on Mars called Perseverance. And it has something like a cordial on it. Except it's cordials, uh, it's uh, are not this long. They're about the size of a, a roll of dimes. And they're taking out little samples from one particular area called Jezero Crater, which used to be a lake bed. And Perseverance is at the opening of a river. So a river was emptying out into this, uh, you know, this once filled lake. And all this sediment built up, right? Rivers carry things across miles and miles and miles, and then those layers build up. And so Perseverance is going to be doing this. It's going to be drilling down into these old layers and layers and layers of rock. And all that sediment that built up over however much time those rivers existed there. Oh, it looks like i run into bit of a snag with my core drill. There we go. It's going to be take, we're going to be taking core drills from these layers of sediment and maybe it'll find organic materials, the things that life needs in order to survive or to start. We don't know, but we'll find more information and clues when those samples return. Because the plan is not to just leave the samples that Perseverance is collecting there on Mars. You know, everything we've sent to Mars has stayed on Mars. Humans are kind of solar system litter bugs in that way. We send stuff to other worlds, but there's nobody to take it out. So this time around will be a little different. Perseverance is gonna collect these little cores of rock and it's going to store them. You can think of, think of it like putting them in a little briefcase that will then be picked up by another robot in the future. So right now Perseverance is collecting all these rock samples, 
putting them in a tidy package, which will then be picked up by another robot sometime in this decade, and it will be prepared in its own little rocket ship, which will then take off from Mars and then come back to Earth. So this will be one of the first retrieval missions of picking something up from another world and sending it back to Earth. I don't know about you, I have a hard enough time just swinging a, a golf club and hitting a ball into a hole or, or at the putt-putt course. So imagine the effort that goes in from those countries, their different space agencies, you know, the brightest minds in the world, to send a rocket ship to Mars and then to have that thing operate so that it sends something back you know, across hundreds of millions of miles of space. A very incredible uh, pursuit and an incredible mission. So this was just a little demonstration of what is going on, what will happen, what we hope to, to learn, what we hope to find out. And if anyone has any questions, I'm glad to answer them, but I can't hear you. So if you maybe type it up on your phone and bring it up to the glass, I can read your question and try my best to answer it. Otherwise, we have our console here ready for the next rover operators. Come on down, operate our rover here. And if there are no questions, going once, twice, thrice. All right, well in that case, I wish you a wonderful rest of your soul. That's a Martian day, and that means you get 37 extra minutes. So use your Martian 37 minutes however you want. I would personally take a nap. I don't think you can ever have too many naps. Actually, you can, because then you end up just sleeping the day away. Anyway, have a wonderful rest of your day at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you later.